John Morse. I am the president of the board of uh, the World Affairs Council of Western Massachusetts. Uh, and I want to welcome you to today's very special Instant Issues Luncheon featuring Ambassador Mark G. Hambly and Dr. William Morris, who will be speaking to us today about developments on the Arabian Peninsula. And I just have to make the observation uh, that once again today we are uncannily timely in our choice of topics, since as some of you would surely know, even as we speak right now, the Crown Prince of Saudi Arabia, Mohammed bin Salman, uh, is in Washington meeting with President Trump uh, and other administration officials. So we are um, really a, a, a program today ripped from the headlines, and, and perhaps Ambassador Hamley or, or Dr. Marth will have some comments on what may be going on right now uh, as we speak. Uh, Dr. Morris is the Secretary General of the Next Century Foundation, a think and do tank, not just a think tank, a think and do tank, uh, based in the United Kingdom. Um, Dr. Morris is a former journalist and publisher and expert on Arab affairs with close ties and connections with the Arab world. And then it seems almost um, in vain for me to be introducing uh, Ambassador Mark Hamley to this group. You probably all know him every bit as well as I do. He is a longtime member and friend of the council. Uh, he has served in 14 different postings, mostly in Middle Eastern country, serving as the U.S. Ambassador to Lebanon uh, and Qatar, and as the U.S. Consul General in Alexandria, Egypt, and in Jeddah, Saudi Arabia. Uh, he remains active in the Middle East, primarily as trustee of the Next Century Foundation. Um, Ambassador Hamley and Dr. Morris will be speaking to us today about the Arabian Peninsula in 2018, recent developments, and resurgent geopolitics. So please join me in welcoming William Morris and Mark Hambly. Well, thank you very much for your kind words and for your warm welcome. And thanks to everybody for coming out on such a splendid afternoon. A few minutes ago, spring arrived. That's why I'm wearing pink. I'm tired of wearing dull colors and green no longer is appropriate till, uh, till spring comes. But uh, we're gonna talk today largely about uh, a little later about the Arabian Peninsula. But with William Morris here, we're gonna talk first about some basic themes about the Middle East, some of the geopolitics, some of the way that countries are impacting on the issues which daily cross our page in our newspapers and our news accounts about Iran, the views of, of some of the people, and uh, some of the geopolitics which are impacting the Arabian Peninsula. Then we'll go into some more details about what's actually going on in Washington with the visit of Mohammed bin Salman and take things from there. So William, why don't you? Okay. I think I'm gonna use the microphone, maybe uh, I'll feel more comfortable. And uh, say a few words. Yes, I wanted to talk about the whole issue of, uh, yeah, motives in the Middle East and about peace and uh, a few specific issues. Um, and so make some comparisons and, and suggest at least one remedy. The motives, I mean, I think motives are important and we don't often uh, think enough about what the other thinks. We don't stand in the other person's shoes. Uh, so motives really matter to my way of thinking. Iran, for instance, what is the Iranian motive? I deal a lot, uh, Mark and I deal a lot with Iran and Iranian issues. I often speak to Ayatollah Safavi, who is the uh, foreign policy advisor to the supreme leader of Iran and comes, romps back and forth to, to London. Um, his motives, he can't come to the United States because he's like many Iranian officials or, or even non-official who have an association with the government, he won't be given a visa, which I think is a shame. I, I personally, I think we need to talk to these people if we want to influence people. And I think that idea of we have an expression in Britain, I don't know whether you use it in the United States, of sending people to Coventry, of not speaking to them, is dangerous, and it's very, very common. Um, but, um, so I deal with him, hey, what are his motives? It's interesting sometimes, if you, if you talk to Iranian thinkers, especially theological thinkers, uh, about where they're coming from. I mean, um, Syria is really important to them. 
Uh, they care about the Alawites and Syria. Uh, Alawites uh, are, um, of course, they, they regard them as kind of rogue Muslims because they're not really Muslims. They believe in reincarnation and they have all sorts of strange and curious and wonderful ideas and they're, they're very eclectic. They celebrate Passover as well as celebrating Easter and Ashura and Eid al Adha and Eid al Fitr. So they have more holidays than anybody in the universe. But um, they, uh, the Iranians like their hegemony in Syria and they're not going to give it up very easily. They have a very different attitude to Iraq. Iraq where Ali and Hussein died. Iraq draped in blood. Iraq is a place of suffering and sacrifice and they don't actually if you speak to an Iranian theologian they won't really have a vision of peace and stability in Iraq. They want peace and stability in Syria under their hand. Iraq is, is they, they regard it as a place till the end of time that will be a place of suffering. So it's a curious attitude of mind. And they want hegemony. Of course they want hegemony. And they don't want to be too, too dependent on the East. They want to balance things out. So they, they are very keen for rapprochement with the West. But that doesn't actually gel very well with their, their Friday prayer chants of death to Israel and death to America. So you, know, you, you have this kind of schizophrenia in the Iranian mind. But they, um, they, they're becoming increasingly dependent on places like China, which are giving them multi-million multi pound do <coughs> million dollar loans all the time and come with all sorts of conditions. And they feel uncomfortable about that. They want to get more into the Western orbit. And they would claim that they do not, under any circumstances, want weapons of mass destruction. And this is their, I mean, they, their ideologists will say this. Now, whether their military men have a completely different attitude is it's, it's debatable. But I'm just saying there is a, a strong strand within Iranian thinking because their supreme leader is against the concept of weapons of mass destruction. There is a strong uh, strand uh, that doesn't want to pursue this path. Um, they're awkward people, and they have, they're very suspicious people. They believe the world plots against them, and they go for long-term strategy. So they will build a strategy over 20 years. The Iranians will be thinking what their position is in 20 years' time, in terms of the foreign arena, in terms of what's going to happen with Bahrain or with Iraq, and they'll split the world up, and they'll have their men who are there long time, and their committees who are there long time, and they will have a committee for Saudi Arabia committee for Saudi Arabia, Iraq, and Bahrain. There's another committee. They have committees looking at foreign policy over a 20-year plan. So big strategic thinkers, unlike us in the West, we're just reactive. Something happens and we react. So this is the Iranian approach. Um, I want to tell you something about another major group who have been in the news a lot lately, the Kurds. Uh, and I'll tell you a, a story. I mean, uh, I can get this right. In um, the Tigris and the Euphrates, uh, the, in olden days, so the story goes, there was this land, Mesopotamia, and in the Zagros Mountains, there was this um, castle uh, that was carved out of the solid rock with great wooden doors, uh, cedar wood doors, and uh, there was a, a king there called Jemshid, who started out very good, and the, he, he was a nice guy, and slowly he got a sense of pride and decided he was greater than anybody else, and the gods decided to punish him. And so they sent uh, this chap called uh, Hiram down, and, uh, and, and he influenced another young kinglet called Dehak, and, and Dehak killed Jemshid and chopped him in half. And so um, the thing is then, uh, Hiram decided, you know, he was really going to get this guy, this new king, under his control, this sort of demon figure. So he fed him meat, and, and, and Jemshid, uh, De Dehak was now there, and Dehak became stronger and stronger. And he thanks, thanked uh, Hiram, and Hiram kissed him on his shoulder, 
as a sign of respect. And then two great black snakes grew out of the shoulder of, uh, of uh, Dehak. Um, and they took possession of him, and he became the snake king. And he would, he would, he would, the snakes demanded the, the blood of little children. So every, every month, a couple of children from the villages down below were taken and killed to feed the snakes. And there was this, uh, there was this blacksmith down there called Kawa, who was alleged to have had 17 children. It's a lot of children. I don't know if it's a poor wife. But anyway, so the um, 16 of his children were, had been taken by, by, uh, to, to feed this, this monstrous king. And he was furious. He was hammering along, hammering, hammering. And Kawa hammered so much that sparks flew. And that meanwhile, the whole country was going into an eternal winter, and, and things were really miserable. Anyway, so the day came when Dehak wanted the 17th child. And Kawa killed a, a sheep and, and gave, gave the blood of the sheep instead of his child's blood. Um, and, the, and Dehak didn't notice the difference. And then everybody started killing sheep. And the children lived, and they were hidden away in the Zagros Mountains of Iraq. And then they rose up in due course with Kawa and his hammer in their lead. And he killed um, Dehak. And spring came back, and everything was beautiful. And everybody ate walnuts and saw partridges in pear trees. And it was a glorious time. And then, um, and they light bonfires tonight in all through Iran and Iraq and, uh, and much of the Shiite world. They'll be lighting bonfires tonight to celebrate uh, the victory of Kawa. And why is that relevant? Um, Turkey has just taken Afrin in northern Syria. Turkey has invaded Syria. And the first thing they did when they took the Kurdish town of Afrin, having driven out the population, huge numbers of refugees, having driven them out, because they hate the PYD, which is the very people who've been fighting, giving blood and treasure for us to fight, to fight ISIS, to fight Daesh. Our people, our friends, uh, we call them the SDF, the Syrian Democratic Forces. But the, they fought and they died for America and for Britain and for us in the West to get rid of Daesh. They had their own motives, but they did. Their motives are different. Their motives, they want a uh, pride. They're Peshmerga. Peshmerga means ready to die. They wanted a little mini state in northern Syria. Turkey was not having that. So they had to be destroyed. So Turkey has gone into Afrin. And the first thing it did a couple of days ago, when it took the center of Afrin, was to tear down the statue of Kawa, the blacksmith, in the center of the town. The popular, and then, then of course, the, uh, the looting started, and they've, they've looted, they've taken all of the goods, and probably the population have fled, not just from Afrin, but from the 250 villages in, in the whole entire province of Afrin. All the villages have been made into refugees. And we stand back. It's not even in the news, by and large. We just, uh, uh, we can't cope with too much news about Eastern Ghouta. This is a worse tragedy than Eastern Ghouta. At the hands of a NATO ally, at the hands of our NATO ally, and it's happening to the people that fought for us today. So the Middle East is full of difficult situations. Um, and you have difficult motives. And of course, the Turks have their own motives. They're frightened of Kurds. They're frightened of, of Kurdish aspirations. And they also have dreams of hegemony, their own dreams of a greater Turkey. And why not? God bless them. They deserve their dreams. Everybody has their dreams. But it's, it's hard, because dreams conflict in the Middle East, and everybody has different agendas. Um, and, and sometimes, and of course, Israel has, has its concerns. Israel has its own dreams of a safe 
Jewish state in the Middle East, and this leads to, to Israel having its own agenda. And the Saudis have their own dreams with a new young prince, Mohammed bin Salman, whom Mark Hamley will talk about. Great man conducting a very nasty little war in Yemen, but Mark will talk about that. Um, uh, with dreams of hegemony, but a great liberalizer, bringing a new era to Saudi Arabia, a better time for young people, and enormous enthusiasm from the young Saudis for this new would-be king. He will be king, the man who will be king, the, the son of his father, Mohammed bin Salman, who runs Saudi Arabia and who's visiting Washington now and is loved and adored in the West. But four Yemenis, meanwhile, are bombed to smithereens. So, you know, there's a, just a double-edged thing. Um, so we have, we have situations, and these situations play out sometimes. And we, we talk about Daesh. I think it's very important um, to realize that we, Daesh is, is an Armageddon movement. It's, it, it believes it's the last days. And its philosophy is exclusivity, is we are right and you are wrong. So if you want to counter Daesh, we do need in this world a philosophy of inclusivity, of that this is one world. And we're not going to counter Daesh just by beating it into the ground. It's, it's, it's an ideology, and you fight an ideology with an ideology, and uh, we need to actually believe in something. Um, but, uh, and these things play out in little countries sometimes. You get a little country like Bahrain, where the, what is it, the Sixth Fleet or the Fifth Fleet? Fifth I've, Fleet. Fifth Fleet is stationed in Bahrain. Um, and little country which has probably the population of Springfield, Massachusetts. And uh, certainly not much more. And yet, uh, they're all at each other's throats, the Shiites and the Sunnis. Um, based, uh, the Sunnis living in fear, the Shiites are living with aspirations of, of uh, power or influence. There's not a true power-sharing government. They had a, they, they, they had all these tensions. All these people went to school with one another. And the kids run out and, and throw tires across the road and stick, chuck down a, a gallon of petrol. It only takes a gallon of petrol and five tires to, to block a three-lane highway for half a day because it'll take a long time. You can run away, you set fire to the gallon of petrol and the five times. I'm not suggesting you should do this in Springfield, but anyway, <laughs> if, you, if you're angry, um, and the highway's blocked for half a day by the, and the tarmac's melted and heaven knows, it's a mess. And this happens almost weekly, the highways will be blocked and, I mean, policemen get shot for a pastime in Bahrain. Um, that said, uh, the, the government then is pretty ruthless in its repressive measures and it is not into power sharing. So you have a difficult situation amongst people who've all gone to school together and who are all, you know, I mean, what is this world? And, and they're all, all wonderful people, wonderful people, but motivated by fear. Uh, that's why I do think Roosevelt's four freedoms are so great. Freedom from want, freedom of expression, freedom of religion, and freedom from fear, which is the great demon in our world today. And we must never be possessed by it. We must not build foreign policies, whether it's regard to Russia or whatever, on the basis of fear. We must have a strategic vision, in my view. Um, and, and it's easy to, to, to not take responsibility. I mean, here's a comparison for you. World War II in... Um, in World War II, okay, so we fought to get rid of an atrocious Nazi regime. And, and we fought and died uh, for this. And it was a great and noble cause. But we were fighting alongside allies like the Russians, but when they took Berlin, they did some pretty rough stuff. And... Um, when they had their part of Berlin, and there was, uh, and they, there was virtual genocide of certain elements, like the Cossacks. Uh, but it wasn't our responsibility, and and we had to bomb cities severely to liberate them, Berlin, Dresden, 
Um, but it had to be done. Now translate that to Iraq today, um, Mosul, where we've had to bomb that city severely, and Raqqa and Syria, where we've had to bomb that city severely. Um, and things have happened. Uh, there have been atrocities committed by some of our allies who killed their prisoners and so on. Um, but it's not our responsibility. And perhaps it isn't. We've got to do what we've got to do. But I do think we have a reconstruction issue. And I do think we have a responsibility. And if we want to build a safer, better world, then I think it's a duty of governments like Britain and the United States to help rebuild towns like Mosul, because otherwise they're going to be they're going to be wastelands for generations because those people are all displaced. And we complain about them becoming refugees, but if we could only um, help build their homes again, I, I think that would be a great effort on our part. Because the Middle East is filled with war. But one last footnote, it is getting better. There are fewer people killed. Uh, the Arab Spring has been a terrible upheaval. But the, just in terms of human death and suffering, things are getting better. They're getting better in the Middle East. I believe they're getting better in the world. We don't live in a century like the 20th century, where the attrition rate was awful. And, you know, I mean, millions killed, whether it was in the gas chambers or on the battlefield, or so much suffering. Um, it's a better world, and it's a safer world, and it will become a safer world. But all I, I beg of all of us is that we make it a truly inclusive world, where we really care for the other and try and see what the other is thinking. Thank you, William. Um, that, that's a hopeful outlook, and I hope it transpires. Um, certainly one area which could be helpful in making that happen is the Arabian Peninsula, one of the richest areas in the world. Um, let me uh, just talk briefly about what the Arabian Peninsula is. It's seven countries, six of which are members of the Gulf Cooperation Council, Saudi Arabia, Bahrain, Kuwait, Qatar, UAE, and Oman. Um, it is a land that's huge, it's 1.2 million square miles, twice the size of Alaska, about 78 million people in all. That's about the same size as, as Turkey and Iran. Um, on the other hand, you have a lot of discrepancies. You have the highest number of, the highest male-female ratio in the world in some of these Gulf states over here. In the UAE, you have four times as many men, 20 and 30 year old range, any place than, than the rest of the country because of all the foreign workers which are in these countries. Um, you also have uh, the wealthiest country in the world, according to the CIA, per capita income is, is Doha, is, is Qatar, $125,000 per year per capita income. The United States is about 53,000. And you have one of the poorest, Yemen, which before the current war started in 2015 had $2,300 only per year per capita income. So next slide. But when you when we talk about the Arabian Peninsula, we really talk about Saudi Arabia, which is key. And I think Sid certainly has, as has been pointed out by our president, has a knack of picking a topic which is very, very uh, a subject of the day. Namely, Mohammed bin Salman, the Crown Prince of Saudi Arabia, is in Washington today as we speak. He'll be here about three weeks in the United States, traveling to visit uh, Silicon Valley and various arms contractors and other leading business people. We'll talk about that in a minute. But Saudi Arabia is huge. It's 830,000 800, square miles. That's the size of, of Texas and Alaska combined. It's the 13th largest country in the world in terms of land area. Its population is 28 million, of whom 80% are Sunni Muslims, 20% are, are Shiites, 25% are foreign workers, and 70% are under 30 years of age. 75% under 35 years of age including Mohammed bin Salman, who's only 32. Next slide. Now, what we're seeing at the moment in Saudi Arabia is a transition to a new king. Since the founding of Saudi Arabia, this is really the third kingdom of Saudi Arabia. 
Um, we had the first one back when George Washington was fighting the French Indian Wars in the 18th century in 1756. You had a man named Muhammad ibn Saud and another man, Muhammad ibn Abu Wahhab, Saud being a political tribal leader, Abu Wahhab being a religious cleric who wanted to clean up the, the apostates who were running the country. And they formed a political religious movement which swept across the entire peninsula. Didn't get into Oman, they didn't get into Yemen, but they went into part of the UAE and into Doha, and into Qatar, and spread the Wahhabi version of Islam. It's a very conservative version. And then there, that was put stuffed out by the Turks who were nominally in control in 1818. Another kingdom came up, that was also uh, stuffed out. But then in, in the early part of the 20th century, Abdulaziz, uh, King Abdulaziz came, came to four. He came from, out of exile in Kuwait, went to Riyadh to the Mismak fort, took over, with only six men, took over this fort. You still see a, a spear head in, that, in the wall of this little fort, which still sits in Riyadh today, and took over and started to create the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia and brought together this country in a, uh, over the period of the next uh, 15, 20 years into what became current Saudi Arabia, formed in 1932. Since that time, it's been ruled by his sons. Uh, starting with his eldest, Saud, uh, was not very capable. He was bankrupt in the country, so he was replaced by the family by King Faisal in 1963. He then ruled 1975 when he then was assassinated by one of his nephews uh, because he tried to introduce TV, television, into, into Saudi Arabia and was not viewed as being, uh, being against the Quran. And then we had uh, uh, King Khalid uh, took over. Uh, he took over actually supposed to be Muhammad, another brother, but he was considered Muhammad the two evils. He had evil of alcohol and also had a terrible temper and the family thought it wouldn't be a good ruler. So he sort of stepped aside and led the family, but Khalid took over a very wonderful king. Was not very active, a little ailing in health. So Fahad became crown prince, very active, then became king. And then Abdullah came, became king in 2005, 2015, and then Salman became king. Salman is cut from a little bit of a different cloth. For many years after World War II particularly, Saudi Arabia was an oasis of stability. You had the royal family, 7,000 princes, balancing power, they all divvied up the power and all made, made decisions by consensus. Uh, they had a population who was cradle to grave, sort of supported, and because they got, got their electricity bill paid, their education paid, became very, uh, very loyal to the, to the rulers. And then you had the religious establishment, which, uh, which was given control of education and basically kept the morals of the country in a, in a, in a very restrictive, conservative way, which, which kept them happy. And so that was Saudi Arabia up until about 1979, when you had an episode take place too. One in Iran, it's the first year of the revolution, Khomeini came to power in Iran, creating a theocratic state. He became a model for many Muslims around the world, particularly in Pakistan, Indonesia, and other places, as being the first Muslim ruler who was able to throw out the big state in the U.S. And all these Arab nationalists, Abdel Nasser, who till then had been secular, secular uh, supporters after World War II, they had not been able to do that. They were always being, uh, being, being um, 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 put down upon by the United States and other big powers. So they had Khomeini, a Shiite Muslim, becoming this, this very powerful force. And the Saudis then also had an episode in the Grand Mosque in Mecca in 1979. And a group of Saudis, 400 of them, took over the mosque and proclaimed the family of, of the Al Saud being, being profligate, not following the course of true Islam, and they had to be forced out by military means over, over a two, three week, very bloody campaign, which shook the Saudi establishment. And at that point then they decided they had to redo their, their roots again, so the religious establishment, which gave permission for this, this assault in the Grand Mosque, was given more control over education, over, over morals, and became very conservative society, more so than it had been before that date. But Salman, that went on quite well until 2015. Oil prices kept increasing, money kept coming to the Exchequer, $800 million was in the, uh, $800 billion was in the foreign exchange reserves when Salman took over. But there was a problem. Oil price had dropped. The Saudi population had increased dramatically. When we were there uh, 30 years ago, there were only 6 million Saudis, not 28 million in the country. 
25 percent of whom are not Saudis, but you have a huge increase in population. The oil that are being exported was now being increasingly used for domestic uh, consumption. There was no such thing as conserving that, that uh, electricity or anything. So the country is largely starting to go broke. And so Salman decided, I think there's no evidence of this at all, that his closest relative was his young son Muhammad. Um, he'd had a, a, a stroke at one point, years back, and all the other sons, he had 13 children, 13 or 14 children, but Muhammad stayed with his father, helped him through his recovery. He was his, his voice when he couldn't speak well, he was his, his writer when he had to draft things, he was very close to his father, so when he became crown prince uh, in 2011, uh, 2012, um, Muhammad bin Salman became head of his, his royal court and then moved into the position of being, being uh, Minister of Defense in January, next slide, in January uh, 2015. So what we have a situation is the kingdom suddenly is faced with a whole new set of characters. You have uh, King Salman takes over, the last most junior son of Abdul Aziz takes place as crown prince, that's Mukran. And then Muhammad bin Nayef, the second generation, came in as, as, as deputy crown prince, a new position. Um, Muhammad bin Nayef had been the son of, of the Minister of Interior, had been there for 40 years. And he was a very capable man. He was one viewed as being very strongly in terms of the countering the Al Qaeda movement in Saudi Arabia in the in early 2000s. He defeated them, pushed them off into Yemen, so there's still a problem down there. But in Saudi Arabia, pretty much quelled them, was injured in a bomb blast, but still was a very favorite of the United States. We felt very confident with him in the position of running the interior ministry. But in March, um, Mohammed bin Salman became Saudi Minister of Defense. He was 30 years old. It seems young. But keep in mind that throughout its history, the Saudis always promoted their, their young people into positions of power. Faisal became became foreign minister in 1930 at age 24, remained foreign minister until his death in 1975 with just two years without being foreign minister, so there for 48 years. Um, Saud al-Faisal, his son, became foreign minister upon his death in 1975 and remained that until 2015 when he unfortunately passed away, a very capable foreign minister. Um, so the fact that Salman became defense minister at 30 was not all that unusual. Sultan. His predecessor had been, was 32 when he became defense minister, so we shouldn't make too much of that. But in March 2015, the king arranged a 10-nation Islamic coalition, largely by saying, we'll give you money if you come support us. They launched a war against the Yemen's Houthi rebels. The Houthis are a Shiite, kind of a, an offshoot of the Shiite movement in, in Yemen, who took exception to the fact that the uh, Saudis had been sending down uh, missionaries to convert Houthis, to convert Zaydis, who are the Shiite uh, majority of that part of Yemen, into Wahhabis. But they didn't like that, so they had their own movement to counter that. And gradually, there was an effort to try to, uh, there was a, an Arab Spring effort in 2011. Abdul Saud, the longtime president, was replaced, but came back to the country, was allowed to remain, uh, and there was a whole civil insurrection started in Yemen, and in 2014, the Houthis moved down, took over Sana'a, and kicked out the president, and who went off to Riyadh in result. So you had a situation where Mohammed bin, bin, uh, Mohammed bin Salman decided that this is something we have to stop. And so we have a quick little war, let's get rid of the, of the Yemenis, let's bring back the old Yemeni government, and that hasn't quite worked out. But in June, he kept going, Mohammed bin Nasser, the Mohammed bin Nayef, the crown prince, was removed, unheard of. Mohammed bin Salman was promoted crown prince, uh, an heir apparent. Um, meanwhile, there was also a family dispute in the Gulf Cooperation Council. Saudi Arabia arranged for three other countries, Egypt, Bahrain, and UAE, to join in blacklisting Qatar, breaking relations with Qatar, complaining that Qatar had been. Uh, uh, was supporting terrorism and uh, supporting efforts to, uh, to subvert all their governments. But that didn't stop there. In September, the Royal Court announced, made some positive moves. Mohammed bin Salman announced women could drive. Now, women were never prohibited from driving, but you had to have a license to drive, and no driver's license ever been issued to women. So that was the issue. 
I did know one woman in Dahran, a Saudi woman, who did have a driver's license. She drove around the Aramco compound very proudly, but she could never drive outside that. Mohammed bin Salman also appealed to establish a general entertainment authority. First time you could bring concerts. And later he said women can now attend sports, sports events. So all these things started to appeal to who, people who are his constituency, namely the young people of the country. In October 2017, Mohammed bin Salman announced two things. One, he decided that, that the religious authority, the Motawa, who are the guys who go around, anybody in the street they can arrest for doing immoral behavior, in other words, for having a skirt which went to your knee rather than to your, to your ankle. Um, he restricted their threats. They could no longer do that. It replaced the head of the organization. And he also announced that we're going to have Vision 2030. We have to wean Saudi Arabia, said, off its oil dependency because we're going to go broke without that. So 2030 was a big plan, very ambitious, um, to completely change a country which basically people don't really work that much. 40% unemployed, underemployed between the ages of 18 and 35. So it's a big problem there. He also announced that 5% of Saudi Aramco was to be sold at first in 2018, then in 2019, to raise revenue. Some expectations that we have $2 trillion worth of revenue. That's not going to happen. Um, the Wall Street Journal reported today that has now been really downsized, that they're not going to, to put an IPO out for Saudi Aramco anytime soon. They'll offer under the Saudi exchange probably. Only a couple hundred billion dollars are anticipated from that source. Next slide, please. Then in November of last year, about 320 members of the royal family, businessmen, former ministers, military people were arrested, detained really, in the, royal, uh, the Ritz-Carlton Hotel in Riyadh, um, which was an extraordinary move. These are people that I knew very well when I was in Saudi Arabia, um, head of the Chamber of Commerce, leading business people. Uh, the head of bin Laden, the Baka bin Laden company, the largest construction company, which had built both the great mosques in, in Medina and Mecca, were arrested. Eleven members of the, of the royal family were detained, including three sons of King Abdullah, Mut'ab bin, Ab Mut bin Abdullah, who was the head of the National Guard. He was replaced. Um, his brother, Mishal, who was former governor of, of Medina and, uh, and, uh, and Turkey, Bin Abdullah as well was also um, arrested. In addition, uh, Major General Ali Kahtani, who worked with, with, uh, with Turkey, was uh, apparently uh, did not survive the experience. It's believed he perhaps was uh, sort of died in custody, and his body was indicated he might have been uh, severely mistreated. Meanwhile, this strange story of Saad Hariri, Prime Minister of Lebanon, being summoned to Riyadh and not leaving for two weeks, uh, being more or less detained resigning from the country, then going back to, uh, to Lebanon and rescinding his resignation. A very unusual tale. It involves uh, Saudi Arabia's belief that Iran was planning to do things with Hezbollah in Lebanon and basically wanted to have a confrontation with, uh, with, with Iran, with Israel getting involved, the U.S. getting involved on, against Hezbollah. Didn't play out that way. Uh, President uh, Francis, President Macron soothed things out a bit. So that has back on balance a bit, but a very strange episode. The true story is, has yet to really to be, to be known. In January 2018, another 11 princes were arrested. They went to protest, allegedly, that they had to pay their electricity bills the first time. Um, in fact, I'm told by others, they really went to protest that there was lack of compensation for the family of a cousin, another Al Saud member, who had been executed, beheaded, for murdering uh, somebody the next uh, and then finally, we have last, last month, February 27th, there was a late night purge of the entire military command. The chief of staff of the military command was replaced, as were the heads of the air, land, and missile defense forces, um, all replaced by, by people who are, are loyal, to, uh, loyal to the king and to, to Mohammed bin Salman, who's minister of defense. He also appointed the first vice minister, first woman vice minister, and open up military employment to females. So they could now do things, uh, non-military uh, type activities in the military. So all these things are leading towards, um, towards his vision of a new Saudi Arabia. In March 2018, you know, normally if you are, are, are feel very endangered by your, 
by your circumstance you would stay at home to guard things. He went first to the UK and to France and Egypt on a, on a trip, went back home and now he's in the United States for about three weeks visiting Washington today, then off Silicon Valley to Houston, to Boston, Philadelphia, where he'll visit uh, leading uh, uh, contractors, Silicon Valley, to get them engaged more in terms of his vision of Saudi Arabia being a new, a new uh, economic power in non-oil sector. He's going to create a whole city based on robots. Uh, but he's a man who's, who stated in his interviews, I think believes very sincerely, that we're going to have a country which, um, which is, is a moderate Islam country. We're not going to have Mutawa running around every place. It's Mohammed bin Salman here, there's his father. Um, but the question people have is, with all these changes coming so quickly by someone who is only 32 years of age, that is he bringing chaos or is he actually going to promote reform? Uh, the question is very much out on that. And a bit about his name, Mohammed bin Salman. Some days there's a lot of people named Ben in Arabia, it seems. Well, bin just means son of, it's Ibn. But bin Salman. So his real name is Muhammad bin Salman, Muhammad son of Salman, bin Abdulaziz, son of Abdulaziz, bin Abdurrahman, bin Faisal, bin Turki, bin Abdullah, bin Muhammad ibn Saud. It all goes back seven generations to Muhammad ibn Saud who started that first Saudi kingdom. Next slide, please. So there's a real generational split in Saudi Arabia. One would think with all these changes and things, people must be very, very upset. In fact, among the business community, um, people my age, um, there's concern that there might be too much going on, that the change is so drastic from the kingdom under, under King Abdullah that people are very, very rattled. But one reason, this one reason why he's moved so, so quickly to contain those people that he arrested on, on corruption uh, levels could always be people who might be viewed as being a force which might uh, quite, uh, uh, coalesce to become a force against him. By attacking them the way he did, as corruption, all of them indeed had uh, various reasons for, for uh, you accused them of taking more money than they should have out of the public till. Um, nonetheless, um, he's now put that aside. They're no longer a threat. And besides, he's very confident that with all Saudi, 70% or 30, almost to one, they're very, very happy with Mohammed. Bin Salman. We have a couple of interns in London from Saudi Arabia who are delighted by him. They think he gives them hope, he gives them um, promise, all sorts of wonderful things. But now, why should this be a U.S. part? What's our role in all this? You know, we have a wonderful relationship with Saudi Arabia, which went back to, to uh, <coughs> President Roosevelt and Ibn Saud meeting on the USS Quincy in February 1945, just when Roosevelt was coming back from Yalta shortly before his death the following April. And the very unique chemistry between these two men. Roosevelt sitting over here on his wheelchair. Um, Abaziz came in, very bad arthritis, and creeped in, sort of. And Roosevelt said to him, using, uh, this is Eddie, his interpreter, later minister of Saudi Arabia, William Eddie of OSS fame. He said, I'm so sorry, your, your majesty. I'd normally stand to greet you, but as you see, I, I can't. He, I'm in my chair. Abdulaziz said, no problem, no problem, I understand, at least I can still walk. And at the end, they had three days of talks. They had sheep on board, this large sheep. The Navy was most interested in the, in the uh, protocol. Very, very liberal what they allowed them to do. But then the three days, Roosevelt had two wheelchairs. He gave one of his wheelchairs to Abdulaziz. He also said, you have such a huge kingdom. Let me give you something else. He gave him a DC-3 and a, and a crew. So the king could then fly all over the country, I think days and without roads, he could be there in a matter of, of, of hours. Um, so on his, on his deathbed, King uh, Abdulaziz had allegedly two words of advice for his, for his sons who gathered around him. One, he said, to succeed me, start my eldest son and move through the progression, choosing only the best of you. And that's what they did. Saud was replaced, he wasn't competent. Muhammad never got a choice, he was, he was being too, uh, uh, emotionally ill-prepared, but right to the sons to Salman, who realizes they no longer do that anymore, and he had to, so he's put his son now in the, the fourth Saudi kingdom to start a whole new line of succession. The second advice, he said, treat the United States as your, as your friend, because we had no colonies. Um, 1933, Southern California had been granted the Saudi oil concession. 
in the eastern province. We're the ones that discovered the oil and gave them their great, their great wealth. Uh, we had no colonies, they liked that a lot. And he granted the U.S. permission to build an air base. Not that the kingdom wanted one as well, but in Dahran we built an air base. Um, so that's also very important. Interesting story about Churchill. Churchill heard that Roosevelt was meeting with Abdulaziz in Cairo. And he was coming from Yalta too, and he ordered them to say, I want to meet with Abdulaziz too. So on the 16th of February, Roosevelt departs Alexandria back home, and Churchill invites Ibn Saud to, to lunch at a, pal, at a restaurant on Lake Fayum outside Cairo. Nothing to give him. They gave him a, gave him a nice jeweled sword. You know, Saudis have lots of swords, wouldn't particularly good. But he said, but I promise you, your majesty, I'm going to send you the best motor car in the world. And he did send him a beautiful, brand spanking new Rolls Royce Silver Shadow. The only problem was, it wasn't from Springfield. <laughs> because Springfield, of course, ours were left-hand drive cars. Silver Shadow's a right-hand drive. And in Saudi Arabia, the monarch does not sit in the back seat. You sit in the front seat next to the driver. And so it was never used. And to this day, I may not, when I was in Saudi Arabia, you could see the car still parked in the Mama Palace in Riyadh, where no one ever drove it because it was the wrong, the wrong, uh, next slide, please. So other considerations of the U.S., um, it was a close ally to us against Afghanistan, against the Soviets, a very strong allies in counterterrorism. Mohammed bin Nayef, as I indicated, was very strong uh, support of that. He was the leader of the Islamic world, a fourth largest economy, major U.S. market. Um, of course, that market it used to be automobiles and that type of thing. Now it's uh, arms. Um, there's 111,000 Saudi students in the United States. They contribute $3.4 billion to our universities. And there's 40,000 Americans working in Saudi Arabia. Here we have uh, King Salman and President Trump last May. Next slide. So under Trump's relations have really improved with Saudi Arabia. Um, until 2017, the Saudis were upset by our positions on Iraq, on Syria, on Egypt, on Bahrain, on Iran. Obama, unfortunately, was viewed as neither engaged nor helpful to them on their, on their positions. Um, Saudi Arabia's covert policies were often not, not, uh, not supportive of our own. Um, in Iraq, a lot of the Islamist groups which were against our troops and killed some of our troops were funded through Saudi sources, also by the Saudi government, but through Saudi money coming in. But the Saudis were certainly relieved by Trump's election, and it's been suggested by multiple visits, by the one now ongoing. Um, and to show that they really want to have good relations, Mohammed bin Salman has appointed his, his full brother, Khaled, who is a fighter pilot, 29 years of age, as ambassador to Washington. So, so there are four problem areas which uh, which really should be highlighted, which are of great concern to the Saudis, where the U.S. had an impact. The first is the question of Iraq. You know, in 2003, Prince Turkey, Prince Saud, everybody warned us, do not go into Iraq, remove Saddam, it'll be chaos. We never asked any Arabist about that. We went in and did it anyways, and the result was indeed chaos. And unfortunately, we should obtain Saudi advice on that. Should have had William's uh, efforts more effort paid to that, we didn't do that. Uh, second, um, U.S. support for the Iranian nuclear accord, this joint comprehensive plan of action. The Saudis do not like it. They believe it does not prevent the Iranians from, from their behavior, which is very injurious to their interests in Lebanon and Syria and in Yemen. And uh, thirdly, the Saudis' war in Yemen, they was three hours notice they were going into Yemen. You don't do that to a good ally, you consult. Not that we consult anyone, we go to war, but in any event, um, we, we, view, we did not view the, the Saudi threat, the Iranian threat from Yemen, quite to the extent the Saudis did. But uh, unfortunately, that has produced a situation now where the, the Houthis, who you, first was a Saudi aggression, then became a Saudi American aggression, and now basically, Radio Sanaa and the, the Houthi media talks about being aggression by the Americans and the Brits using the Saudis as their tools to destroy Yemen. So it's a very bad situation there. And fourthly, there's the Saudi-led boycott against, uh, against Qatar. Uh, Trump basically endorsed that. Um, so there's a great convergence of views on all these areas than there's certainly been under the previous administration. 
But on Iraq, Mohammed bin Salman has done some very interesting things. Um, he has decided that he's got to counter Iran, and he's going to do that with a lot of love and emphasis on Basra, the wealthiest, one of the wealthiest states, a lot of oil there. Uh, it's been ignored by the Iranian central government, by the Baghdad government, as have many outlying areas. So uh, what Mohammed bin Salman did, he invited Muqtadr al sadr one of the leading uh, Shiite leaders from, uh, from Baghdad down to, to, um, uh, to Saudi Arabia. They invited al-Hakim as well. They've both been there. Um, they have opened up an embassy, reopened their embassy in Baghdad. They've opened a consulate in Basra. They've asked to open a consulate in Najaf. That is still being hesitated on. The Shiite uh, leaders do not really want that. But they're going to be developing the petrochemical plant and maybe taking another look at the pipeline, which goes from Baghdad across over the Red Sea to give another access to, uh, to oil. So Iraq, everything's looking quite good, and it's all because they do not like Iran. They want to counter Iranian influence. Then on Iran itself, William's already told you on how uh, the Iranian views about, uh, about uh, Iraq and about Saudi Arabia. They do not like Saudi Arabia. There's a competition there because of the control of the two holy cities. But oral history also impacts Arab attitudes towards Iran. In Saudi Arabia, oral history is still very, very common, and much of that centers about the ancient conflicts and more recent conflicts between Persia and the Arabs. Persia attacked several times in the Arabian Peninsula and vice versa, but uh, that is something which, which is, has to be understood when you look at trying to improve relations between the two countries. I already mentioned that the Iran's 1979 revolution threatened Saudi leadership. Um, Saudi Arabia is protector of Mecca and Medina, and since 1979, the king's formal title is the custodian of the two holy mosques, because they want to emphasize that. So whenever you have a tragedy in, in Mecca, which happened a couple times, 2015, a crane fell crushed a bunch of people, 1,000 uh, uh, pilgrims were killed in a rush at one point a couple years back. Um, these are very, very important to the Saudis to make sure they get that, that process right. Um, Saudi regional policy is, con is, con perceived, is the perceived Shia threat. This is why they're in Yemen, um, because uh, they think this, this, the Yemenis are, are being used as an as Iranian prawn to come up and take over down there. We'll talk about that in a minute. Um, they're strongly opposed to the joint comprehensive ag agreement. Um, this is why Mohammed bin Salman is very pleased by the potential uh, elevation secretary of state of Mike Pompeo, because he's viewed as being, he is strongly against that pact, as is the president. Uh, Tillerson supported it. So on, on Yemen, very rocky history since 1930s, they had a war, Saudis won. In 1960, there was a civil war, um, the Saudis supported the royalists. They then, in 1970, bro brokered a peace which brought in uh, a bunch of, of, of Yemeni Republicans, and they started then promote these people as their, as their men, Abdul Saleh being, being the one man they really put a lot of effort trying to support him. Uh, they brought in Salafism, these missionaries brought down, that upset the, um, the Houthis, that's why the Houthis became, became a force. But their concern now is that with the Houthis, they're concerned that Yemen is an Iranian prawn. Um, but Yemen really is a forgotten war. How many times do you read about Yemen? Very, very few times. But the Iranian threat was spurious to begin with, but now it's becoming a self-fulfilling prophecy. Um, the air campaign has is, is been quite flawed. Unfortunately, the United States does a lot of the targeting for them, but I don't think our advice is taken very often. We've had 10,000 civilians have been killed in this war, many of them by, um, uh, by uh, uh, air incidents. There's a massive humanitarian crisis going on. The latest figure is 24 of the 26 million Yemenis are in need of some kind of food support. We've seen those dreadful pictures of these starving kids. Hospitals have, have collapsed, the health system completely collapsed, the water system has collapsed. Um, there's no end game in sight. Perhaps the replace of those military officers in February means that Mohammed and Salman wants to relook the situation. But the problem with Al-Qaeda remains. We were involved in Yemen not for our humanitarian interests, but to fight Al-Qaeda, which was strongly based down in, in, in eastern Yemen, in the Hadramaut area of Yemen. And we, that's we used drones to take out Anwar al-Awlaki, this dreadful American uh, 
Yemeni, American born but Yemeni uh, cleric, has been very prominent in terms of influencing terrorists in our own country, the Chattanooga bomber, the, the San Bernardino bomber, all of which uh, uh, came from, from his fossilization. But we have real problems in terms of, 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 of Al Qaeda, which remains, as does, does ISIS. ISIS has not been destroyed yet. But the U.S. now is viewed equally as, as the enemy by the Houthis. That can change, but that's a problem now. Then on Gutter, now Gutter is always boxed above its weight. A delightful country. First, I had, had three wonderful years in Doha. It's a small country, half the size of Vermont or New Hampshire. Um, it has uh, 2.4 million people, of whom only 313,000 in 2014 were actual gutteries. I think it's more than like half a million, but that's what they say. But try as it might, its neighbors have never been able to swat away the many agreements that they have against Doha. And chief among these are support for the Muslim Brotherhood. Um, Egypt, when Morsi became president of Egypt, the gutteries poured in billions of dollars to support him. Um, that was not liked by Saudi Arabia or the UAE particularly. UAE uh, figured there was an Egyptian-led Muslim Brotherhood plot against it, and it's drawn against the Muslim Brotherhood. Um, Saudi Arabia a little less so, but um, it hosts many Muslim Brotherhood uh, refugees from Egypt that are in Doha, particularly one prelate called uh, Yusuf al qaradawi He is a leading member of the Muslim Brotherhood. When we were in Egypt in the 1970s and later in the late 1980s, Qaradaw would always come to lead the prayers after Eid al-Adha, the public prayers, to the radical Salafi movement who would, who would, who would attend these things. It was frightening. At the end of the Arab Spring in, in at the fall of Mubarak in Cairo, you didn't have, have Irian, the wonderful young man from Facebook that sort of led the popular revolution. He didn't speak at that event. Yusuf al Qaradawi did, the Egyptian by birth, and it must be in the late 80s now, uh, has at least one son in the U.S. Um, he tried to go to the U.S. Army, said I wouldn't give him a visa, he didn't like me very much, but in any case. Um, also, Al Jazeera, fabulous radio station, very different in English than it is in Arabic. In Arabic, it takes sides. In, in Iraq, it was very much in favor of the, of the Sunni revolt very much against us. We had a lot of issues with it. They were the ones that interviewed bin Laden uh, quite a bit. Um, it's, a, it, and, and they're, it's a fabulous studio they have. Their English version is much more moderate. The Arabic version is much more uh, critical of governments, of Saudi Arabia, of Egypt, of UAE, and they've gotten a lot of trouble. And the, these four countries, Egypt, Bahrain, UAE, and uh, Saudi Arabia, want Al Jazeera closed down is one of the things. They want to have the MB thrown out. They want to have, uh, have uh, Gutter's good relations with Iran terminated, or at least calmed down. But of course, what this has done is forced Gutter into a relationship with, with, uh, with Iran. They've also buttered up Turkey. Turkey has now 5,000 troops in, uh, in a base in, uh, in Doha, outside Doha, which the Saudis don't like that either. But uh, President Trump has largely endorsed uh, the Saudi moves. Um, Tillerson prevaricated. We have an Exxon mobile gas. We, we run the gas, which gave Gutter its huge economic advantage. And when we were there in 1995, Gutter's annual wealth was $8.6 million. By 2012, thanks to Gutter Gas, Exxon Mobil, $212 billion. One little country. So it's a very well, and it uses that money in, uh, in ways which, you know. Well, final thoughts. There's our president. Um, it's from The Economist, actually. But I loved it. Um, but what, what should be done, what, what is being done, really two sides of the same coin. Um, we should be tough on Iran, but, uh, but we shouldn't provoke her unnecessarily. As William says, you know, I, I've been a strong believer we should arrange to have talks with even back channel direct talks with a lot more than we certainly do at the moment. Um, we did have back channel talks with them during the, during the nuclear discussions, and a lot of those have tripped Operation Cassandra, which is playing through the media, this where apparently we decided we would close off um, our attack on Hezbollah, some money laundering efforts with the drug cartel south of our border. We'd ease off on that as part of our, and if that's true, that is a real combination of the Obama administration. I don't know if it is or not, but there's an ongoing investigation about whether or not 
that was part of the deal. There are all sorts of private parts of the Joint Comprehensive uh, uh, Agreement which we don't know about. We should broker a peace on Yemen. We can't really play a role in that directly because of our alleged, not, uh, alleged neutrality. We can encourage the Saudis. Look, you can only have so many enemies. They've got three. Iran, Yemen, and Bahrain, uh, and, and Doha, and, and Qatar. They should, you know, focus on one, not three. You have too many other issues. And Yemen should be the one which has cost them $25 billion uh, a year at least. Um, they need that money. So we should do something on Yemen, if only because we also have a large Yemeni American community in our own country. They're not very vocal. They aren't politically astute. They're not well organized. We have 12, 15,000 living in Yemen, which we did not even offer any evacuation to. If we closed our embassy, it would be our military. And we owe something on that. It's a wonderful country. Um, we also need to find new openings on Syria and define our policy on Turkey. Where are we going to have a big clash in Turkey? Um, they're in Afrin, which is um, you know, way up there in the northwest. The Turks move along, they're going to run to us pretty soon. We have 2,000 uh, troops. Uh, signed to Syrian Democratic Forces. Um, and, you know, it's, it's a problem. We've got to do something before it explodes. Um, we also need to fill empty diplomatic posts, both in the Middle East and in Washington. How can we conduct diplomacy without ambassadors in these countries? We have one neither in Syria, neither in Syria, or in uh, Riyadh, or in, uh, in Qatar, or Libya. No, no place. But in a place where we do have functioning embassies, we should have ambassadors there. There's no excuse not to have people. Maybe it's the names that come up and just haven't been gone through the system yet. But it's something we should do. Also, Department of State. There are so many positions uh, lacking. We can't give expertise advice to the President or even to the Secretary of State on issues which we have to face. Not just the Middle East, on Korea as well. Our lead Korea specialist retired last month. So in short, we need to exercise thoughtful leadership and less grandstanding to uh, protect our interests and those of our friends and allies in the region. And that's something which uh, I think we minimally expect that from our government. Let's hope we can. But that's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you. We have about five minutes for a few questions. Will I come over here? Chips had a question over there. Do we give him a microphone or? No, I'm just getting out of the way. Oh, okay. there we are. Why don't you pass that microscope to Chips? Oh. Pass this one right. I, I, I can. I okay, can good. Speak loudly. Good. Uh, in, in our work to uh, have a good policy on Turkey, how about the Kurds? Is there any hope in the next 20 years that uh, uh, there's going to be any potential direction that uh, the world can? Help the Kurds out? Well, we love the Kurds. I'll let William take a crack at that because we love the Kurds. How do we help the Kurds? How are we going to help the Kurds? Why oh, the dear Kurds. I mean, Mark and I were in Kurdistan, what? Uh, September. What, yeah, when was it? What were September. We there? September, that's right, for the referendum. And we wandered around. He's like sort of Yogi Bear, and I'm Boo Boo, and I follow him around. <laughs> and uh, except we have a kind of reverse role because. Because isn't it um, Boo Boo that keeps Yogi out of trouble, but you keep me out of trouble? Well, most, yeah. I tried but, to. Well, anyway, we, we go around. We were in the Nineveh plane. Um, it's it's there are sort of miserable situations, and you know of these um, miserable situations uh, that have emerged in today's Iraq. A lot of them to do with refugees. Uh, what do you do with the Yazidi women, uh, the ones that were taken as slave brides? They come back. Some of them get married again, but they're coming back with little baby children. Some of them, their families won't take back, uh, you know. Um, some of them do get taken back. So what do you do with all those women? Um, and uh, it's a problem. There's social problems. There are problems. What do you do with the Daesh women? We killed all their husbands. They hate us. What are we doing with them? We're keeping them. There's a large prison camp south of uh, Kirkuk. Um, and uh, about 600 women and children there uh, in prison in, in a camp with barbed wire. They're not allowed out. They hate 
Haytas, those are Iraqi women. There are also there are three camps in <coughs> northern Syria uh, full of foreign fighters' wives. Countries don't want them back. What do you do with all those women? And their children, all their children uh, in camps. You have a lot of social problems. Uh, what do you do with all these refugees? Because Kurdistan can barely cope with all the refugees. Kurdistan overstretched itself with its referendum on independence. It was a bad mistake at a bad time uh, when Kurdistan was, was divided. Uh, and now, now Turkey is moving in from the north. It's threatening to bomb villages in, in response to extending its campaign against the PKK and PYD. Uh, PYD is the Syrian Kurdish group. PKK is the same incarnation, the Kurdish group in, in Turkey. Um, and what do you do? I mean, the, the Turks are moving south. They've, they've already taken, they have a Bashika. They've, they've established a new military base uh, in the Yazidi town of Bashika in the Nineveh Plain. Um, what do you do with all the Christians? Uh, they're driven out and, uh, of course, we in the West are more willing to take Christian refugees and therefore uh, countries like Iraq are, are losing all their Christians. Christians, I mean, we were in a little town of uh, um, uh, Akush, mm. uh, you know, and they were waiting in terror for the Heisht al-Shabi to come, the Shiite mm. fighters, um, how with the women with their suitcases packed beside their beds, in absolute terror of the Heisht al-Shabi, more frightened of Heisht al-Shabi than frightened of ISIS. Uh, what are you going to do with all of those refugees and all these people? Kurdistan takes a huge burden of refugees from Syria, from Iraq, from all over the place, minorities, and uh, they need help. Uh, and it's an easier place. I mean, reconstruction is necessary everywhere, uh, particularly in the Sunni areas. But Kurdistan is an easier place to reconstruct. They're great allies of the United States of America. They fought and died for America, uh, for our projects. They stand with us. Um, um, we kind of need to stand with them a little more. Yeah, I think what we have to do basically is wait till um, if a body wins, hopefully in the next election, who knows, work to ensure the Kurds get the, the re that restore the regional rights they get under the Constitution, the quasi-autonomy, which they've lost a lot since September. Um, they don't want to control their airports. The airports haven't even been reopened yet, supposed to reopen soon. And hopefully, you know, it's best we can do there. Same thing, the job of the, the Syrian group in, in Syria. If we get involved in the Syrian negoci negotiating process, give them autonomy in that group. Turkey won't like it, but uh, you've got to convince the Turks that Rojava would be like the Kurds, had a very good relationship with, with the Turks. So that's the best thing we can do. Eric. From my unprofessional viewpoint, it, it, seems, uh, it seems propitious that we redefine our role with Turkey. I mean, they've gotten a strong man central government. They're, they're no longer secular. And in a lot of respects, they're no longer advantageous. Advantageous to, as an American, uh, close ally as they used to be. Is there any prospect for that? And what is your opinion of that as a future goal? Well, well, Turkey is a key country. It knows it's important to us because of its NATO relationship. It knows it's important to Europe because they open those floodgates and let the four million Syrians who are still in, in, in Turkey, flood across into Europe, disaster. Um, we have to make sure that uh, Erdogan does not tear the, this new nationalism he's starting. We're talking about we need to get back those lands we lost at Tree of Lausanne in 1920 back again, which includes the islands in the Aegean, against Greece, against uh, all. If you look at the map, it's extraordinary. You've got uh, um, territory extends. North Aleppo, across in, taking Mosul, across into, into Kurdish, uh, Kurdish Iraq, all that is, is, is in their grand scheme what they want to get. But I think we can't afford to have a bad relationship with Turkey. We have to continue to keep a diplomatic presence, keep dialogue going, and not make the same mistake we make so often, is to close ourselves off and not talk to governments. So it's difficult. But I think if anybody breaks, they have to break it. We shouldn't be the ones that break it. Please. Reference um, a, a 
Iran's uh, nuclear uh, power program. Um, you know, that really is a threat to the region. I mean, what can we expect in the foreseeable future as far as action on the part of Israel? I don't see Saudi Arabia idly standing by as time goes on and not possibly going to their own, you know, nuclear power program, not to mention uh, Turkey or even Egypt. What does the future look in this region as far as uh, the nuclear threat? Well, the joint uh, comprehensive plan of action gave us a window maybe another 10, 15 years we'd have to worry about that because inspection was supposed to make sure that we're not developing nuclear weapons. And that was the hope of many people who supported that agreement. And that during that time, you'd have a re restoration of greater prosperity. And it's the middle class in Iran. You start to have a differing political culture develop in Iran, which wouldn't be interested at all in having nuclear weapons, um, very much like some of the theologians that, that William mentioned. Um, unfortunately, the, this administration um, believes that plan was flawed, believes it was a terrible negotiation, believes there were that it is not in our interest that, in fact, Iran is going to develop these weapons anyways, and they want to, to find new ways to sanction Iran to make sure it doesn't do that. Israel supports that. Saudi Arabia supports that, too. So in May, um, until now, Mattis of Defense and Tillerson, and even uh, um, our, our, our now security advisor, all cost the president against breaking this agreement. But now uh, Tillerson's gone. Uh, Pompeo, if he gets in, is strongly against revoking that, that agreement. So we have to count on Europe, perhaps, uh, standing in and making sure that, that, that Iran holds, holds back a bit. But um, it's an issue. Want to say something about that? Yeah, I, I think I switched this on. I'm not sure I have. So let me see what this button is. Um, but um, I'll just come and stand next to you. And you're nice and loud anyway. Um, the, the thing is that. Uh, <laughs> The thing, the thing is that we do need, uh, we need somebody negotiating, talking to Iran. And, and then people can go in and inspect Iran, so you can keep them on track and make sure they don't misbehave. Um, in many ways, and, and they are rascals, they, they have dreams of hegemony. I don't think they're going to develop nuclear weapons, but I wouldn't swear to it. But there's certainly the ideology of the supreme leader, the current supreme leader, is very against that. Um, and so, so why not at least inspect them, be talking to them, and have, have people going in, stepping away from them, and closing the doors again, and building up new sanctions, and shutting them away from the international community. I mean, they're much more likely to misbehave, I would say. Uh, if we don't talk to them. So I, I'm, I'm sorry to see the present trend. Yeah. Well, one more? We're done. We're, done. <laughs> We're, we'll stay behind a few minutes. <laughs>